वंदे हम श्री गुरु श्री जुटहापद कमल श्री गुरु वैष्णवाश्च श्री रूप सागर जात सहगन रघुनाथन्वीता तम सजीव साध्वैत सवधूत परीजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पाद सागना ललिता श्री विशाखा ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानंजन शलाकय चक्षुन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम मुखम कौति वाचाल अंगों लंगायते गिरि यत्पतमह वंदे श्रीगुरोन्नता नाम श्रेष्ठ मनमी सचीपुत्रग्रजमुरुपुरी मातुरी गोष्ठमाति <coughs> राधा कुंद गिरीवर अहो राधिका माधवाशा प्राप्त यतीत कृपया श्री गुरुन्तन्नतोस्मि हे श्री गुरु ज्ञानद दीन बंधो स्वानंद करुणक सिंधो बृंदावन आसीन हिताबतार प्रसिद्ध राधा प्रणय प्रचार अंशो भगवत अहम सदा दासोस्मी सर्वता तत्पापेक्षको नित्यम तत्ष्ट शाको मे स्व राधा सन्मुख संसक्ति सखी संज्ञम निवास निवाम सतत वंदे गुरु रूप परा सखी वंशकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पवनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम नमो महाबजन्याय कृष्ण प्रेम प्रदाय थे कृष्णा कृष्ण चैतन्य नामने गौर तिषे नम <coughs> हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीन बंधो जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिका कांता राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे बृंदवनेश्वरी वृषभानुसुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय भक्त विहीन अपराध लक्ष्य क्षिप्त कामारी तरंग मध्ये कृपा मयि तम शरण प्रपन्ना बृंदे नुमस्ते चरणारविंद बृंदे नुमस्ते चरणारविंद पंच तत्वात्मक कृष्ण भक्तस्वक भक्तवताप्यम नमा भक्तशक्ति श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्रियाद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवास आदि गौर भक्त बृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे फर्स्ट 
First of all, I'm offering my unlimited dandavat pranams and my shraddha pushpanjali at the lotus feet of my most worshipable beloved Guru Dev, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Paramahansa Ashto Tarashata Sri Srila, AC Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. And then I'm offering my same unlimited Dandavat Pranams and my Shraddha Pushpanjali at the lotus feet of my most worshipable beloved Siksha Guru Devs, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Paramahansa Ashto Tarasata Sri Shila, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj, and Nitya Lila Pravishta <coughs> Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Ashtotarasata Sri Shila, Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. And I'm offering my unlimited Dandavat Pranams to the lotus feet of all my Sri Sri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga Gaudiya Guru Sampradaya and my Dandavat Pranams to the lotus feet of all of the Vaishnavas and all of the Vaishnavis. So today is the last day in this solar calendar year. Uh, because the Vedic calendar is based upon the moon, lunar calendar. So China, Chinese New Year. Uh, in the East, they are basing upon the lunar calendar, and in the West, they're basing the changing of the years upon the solar calendar. Right? And uh, according to our Western civilization, they also calculated the number of the years according to uh, the appearance uh, of Jesus Christ. B.C., before Christ, and A.D., after death. But now they use some other, some other um, letters for that. Now, uh, because we are Gaudiya Vaishnavas, and we know who the Supreme Personality of Godhead is, and we know when he appeared, we know his exact titi, both in his appearance as uh, Shyama Sundar, uh, Nanda Nandan Sri Krishna, 5,000 years ago, and as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the combined form of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, only 530 something years ago. So we have a separate calendar, which is the calendar based upon the appearance day of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that I consider New Year. Gaur Purnima. I always have considered that. Not this Western New Year. However, because externally our civilization is going on according to that time calculation, so we observe it, we accept it. But it is not our time of celebrating. But we, I remember once I was with Srila Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj in Philippines. And uh, it was the year 2000 when the calendar was going to shift the millennium. Y2K, they called it. I guess you were quite young then. It was 20 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we were at a resort in the island of Cebu in the Philippines. Gurudev was doing his writing retreats there. And uh, we were there on that night, the New Year's Eve night. And uh, actually it was on this, it was right on the ocean front there. It was a very tropical place. Gurudev had a house just on, right on the ocean. Right out of his front door was the sand and then was the ocean, and there was a pier going out. And, uh, but there was also, uh, in the premises, not far from Gurudev's house, actually, was, you know, like an entertainment center where they had a bar, 
they were serving alcoholic drinks and this and that. And there were a number of tourists because it was quite a big resort. Uh, and But it was mostly quiet. But on that evening, um, the fireworks were happening at midnight, right there. And our residence was in the same property, but quite some distance away, maybe a couple of hundred yards away from right from the beachfront. So when we came the next morning, we were mentioning to Gurudev, oh, Gurudev, maybe that disturbed your sleep, you know, that they were having fireworks at midnight and so forth. It was interesting to see that Srila Gurudev had such compassion for the people, such compassion he had for them. They were absorbed in trying to make their life happy um, by celebrating. That's the tendency in the human society is to celebrate the passing of one year into the next uh, and hoping that in the new year, you know, things will be good, things will be auspicious like that. So the Vaishnavas, the pure Vaishnavas are always praying for the well-being of the human society. And Gurudev, he mentioned something in that regard, how he was, um, he was not disturbed by that. He said, they should also be happy, you know. So actually, this is what the pure Vaishnavas want for all the living entities, is that they will be happy in their normal, natural, eternal condition of servitorship to the Supreme Lord. But even within this world, he wants that they should not have to suffer. We know that even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's great, great devotee, Vasudev Datta, Vasudev Datta Thakur, he could not tolerate how the living entities in this world are suffering so much. You know, there's a pastime, maybe you heard this before, about how Vasudev Dutta was praying that I cannot tolerate anymore. He told directly to Mahaprabhu that all these living entities, they're suffering so much. Please place all of their sins on me, O oh my Lord. I will suffer for them. You know? This is his actual mood. Actually, in the Shaitanya Charitamrita purport, Srila Prabhupada mentions that Jesus Christ is famous for suffering on behalf of the sins of others to save them. But those are the persons who believe and follow him. Vasudev Dutta, he actually said, I think he used the word thousands, thousands of times more merciful because whether they follow or not, he just wants to liberate all of them. And then Mahaprabhu told him, oh, you know that uh, by your desire, by your desire, the living entities will be liberated. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they're liberated, the whole universe will fill up again with unlimited jiva souls. See? So, this past year has been a year of great calamity for the world. Nothing has been seen like this for so long time. And also deception. Unbelievable levels of deception. But whatever anyone is undergoing it is the result of their own karma. And it is the nature of the material world that those who are very evil and demonic, they always try to capture power and control over others. It's been going on from the beginning of the universe, and the demigods and the demons have very great wars and battles. Many stories in Srimad Bhagavatam. But this is the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance on our planet. And it it causes the cause it is the cause of the greatest good fortune of all the living entities. And that is why, although it's Kali Yuga, and Kali Yuga is generally a time that is not considered to be very auspicious, 
But this becomes the most auspicious time. Because in Kali Yuga, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Krishna himself has appeared along with Nityananda Prabhu uh, to give the jivas the highest possible achievement that is, is that any jiva is capable of achieving. Even in millions of lives. Hmm? Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu have come to give the jivas Krishna Prem. And it's not available all the time. And not only Krishna Prem, very specific kind of Krishna Prem. Very specific kind. The highest Krishna Prem of the highest devotees in Goloka Vrindavan. That is what is happening now. And although it may look bleak to various people, very uncertain times, politically and so forth, but actually for the devotees, the devotees know that actually everything is being arranged on the chessboard. Yes. It is all being arranged. Krishna is arranging everything. The planetary uh, cycle that we're going through, uh, it's already there. And there will be certain outcomes from that. So for the devotees of Krishna, it is a time of more intense practice, of becoming more surrendered and more uh, focused and tuned in to performing the most important activities that we can perform in this human body, which is hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, his name, form, qualities, pastimes, remembering all of these. Doing nam sam kirtan, shravanam kirtanam vishnu, smaranam padasevanam, archanam vandanam dasyam. Padasevanam, serving the lotus feet of the Lord. When we go to the holy dham, this is also called padasevanam. When we go on parikrama of the holy dham, padasevanam. The dham is not different than Krishna. And serving the lotus feet of the Lord in that mood, surrendering to the lotus feet of the Lord. Padasevanam, archanam. Then the deity form of the Lord serving and worshiping is called archan. Archanam, vandanam. Offering prayers to the Lord. Then dasyam. There are so many prayers also in our songbooks. So many prayers by the pure devotees of the Lord. And following in their footsteps, we try to sing their prayers. Yes. So, vandanam dasyam sakyam atmanivedanam. To become a servant. Dasyam means to be completely absorbed in the mood of servitude. That I am Krishna's eternal servant. I have no other identity. I have no other purpose than to serve Krishna eternally. And it's true. We've lost our sense of identity as Krishna's servant, but now is time to awaken again. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago. You know that song? Gaur Chandra Bole. Koto Nitra Jao Maya Pisa Chirakole. Bhakti Vinod Thakur wrote. Wake up, sleeping souls. Wake up, sleeping souls. How long are you going to sleep in the lap of the witch Maya? Ah, that's the question he's asking to us. How long are you going to continue sleeping in the lap of the witch Maya? You're sleeping in the lap of a witch. So what else do you expect when you sleep in the lap of a witch that you're going to get pierced and punished? Right? Yes, tortured. How long are you going to do this? Just wake up, sleeping souls. Then he says, Bajiba Bolio Eshe, Sangsara Vitori, Bulia Rohile Tumi Avidyara Bori. He says, Bajibo means I will worship, I will do bhajan, Bajibo. Right? 
Bojiba Bolia Eshe, Samatala Bhutadi. When you entered into this life, this life, your current life and your body, uh, when you were in the womb of the mother, so you made a promise at that time. It's described in Bhagavatam. Did you know this? That the child, uh, it's in the third canto of Srila. It's called The Movements of the Living Entities, that chapter. It's spoken by Lord Kapila Dev to his mother Devahuti. And even Mahaprabhu refers to that. Yes, very, he referred to that when he was leaving home to take sannyas. Because Lord Kapila Dev is describing in detail how the living entity in the human form goes into the womb, how gradually in the womb the development of the body takes place and so forth. And basically the jiva is is in a sleeping condition, like unconscious, until the seventh month. But the seventh month he becomes conscious. And then he he has some special grace given to him by the Lord in that condition. That oh I am here because I've turned away from you, my Lord. So I'm praying, I'm praying, please release me and I'll worship you. Uh, please take me from this condition because he's conscious. And it's describing there that his body is very, very delicate skin, uh, is, is being bitten by worms and other entities that are inside of the mother's womb. It's a very torturing situation. But the living entity has, gets the opportunity to be very, very benedicted and comes to a clear consciousness and a desire to worship Krishna. But gradually as the child in the womb is praying to the Lord in that way, then the natural uh, functions of, of the mother's body begin to push the child out of the womb through the birth canal. And when the child comes out, by the force of the pressure of coming through the mother's birth place, then Maya takes over and covers the jiva. And now the jiva is lying there pitifully, weeping and crying. Uh, but in the course of the following days and weeks and months, then everyone is lavishing the baby with so much affection. But still, he can't express himself, he can't speak. So when he's suffering, so, so much crying, 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 crying. You see? So the thing that Lord Chaitanya was telling in this song is that, oh, jivas, oh, you jivas, you forgot that when you came into this world, you said, Bajibo, Bajibo, I will worship, I will worship you. But Bulia Rohile Tumi Abidyarabori. But forgetting this, Bulia means to forget. So you have fallen into a condition of uh, forgetfulness. And that in that forgetful state, Avidyara Bore. Avidya, you heard that word, vidya and avidya? What's the meaning? I'm just agreeing that I've heard the word. <laughs> okay, avidya. Vidya means knowledge. Vidya. Vidya means vidya. knowledge. And also the word veda and vidya are connected by that root. Vidya and avidya means ignorance. Avidya. Actually, this is our disease. In the song, Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying, Oh, Jivas, uh, you have fallen into avidya, ignorance. So then he says, he says, Tomare loite ami hoinu avatar. This is Lord Chaitanya speaking to us. Tomare loite ami hoinu avatar. For delivering you, O oh Jivas, that is why I have descended. Hoinu avatar. Avatar means descent. And then he says, 
Ami Bina Bandhu Ar Kya Chaitanya. Other other than me, what other real true friend do you have in this material universe other than me? Uh, Ami Bina Bandhu. Bandhu means friend. Kya Chaitanya. Who do, who, what other friend do you have other than me? And Mahaprabhu says, E Nechi, Aushadhi Maya Nashi Barunadi. I have brought with me the medicine that you need. Aushada means medicine. In Ayurvedic medicine, they have the word Aushad. It means medicine. So E Nechi means I have brought. I have brought with me Aushadi Maya Nashi Baralagi, the medicine that will completely destroy this disease of Maya that you are suffering from. Nashi Bara means to destroy. In H. Aushadi Maya Nashi Baralagi, Hari Nam Maha Mantra Lao to me, Magi. This Hari Nam Maha Mantra. I have brought. This is the medicine. Now you should beg this from me. Uh, and then Bhakti Vinod Thakur writes, Shashadimaya Shibaramani, Lao Magi. I forget the last verse. But he's saying that this Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he has. He has um, received, this Bhakti Vinod has received this Maha Mantra uh, and surrendered at the lotus feet of Goranga Mahaprabhu. Bhakti Vinod Prabhu, Charane Pariya. Yeah, Charane Pariya means I've fallen at the feet of Prabhu, Mahaprabhu. And then Harina, what? Say Harina, Say Harina. Yeah. Magiya means to beg. So say Harina Mantra. I have fallen at the feet of Lord Garanga and now I have begged from him this Maha Mantra. Beautiful song. So, uh, this is our only business for this year that is just now leaving us the number 2020. Uh, but Krishna's movement of the planets are going on for trillions of years. Trillions. Lord Brahma's lifespan of 100 years of his time is actually something like 500 trillion uh, of our earthly time. Trillions. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, the uh, the necessity that we have there is no greater necessity uh, no no nothing as urgent nothing as pressing as receiving this maha mantra from the lord chanting doing bhakti to krishna in all of its forms, nothing as urgent as this. And therefore, for the devotees, the passing of one year into the next doesn't really change anything. You see? It doesn't really change anything. Of course, we can, they have this custom in the West of New Year's resolutions, right? That people are going to, they promise they're going to do something that's good for them, their New Year's resolution. It's like a vow, like a vrata, you know. But what, are the, what is the vrata of the devotees? The vrata of the devotees is only that my devotion will increase, right? My devotion will increase. I will be more successful in my <laughs> attempt to surrender to you, my Lord, solely, wholly, fully, without any reservation like this. This is the only desire of the devotees. So, 
So anyway, I just wanted to mention this because it's New Year's Eve, right? And it, things have not been normal. Mm -hmm. Things have not been normal. It's been a very, very strange time. Strange. Yeah. And of course, things will shift and things will change. And we don't exactly know on what time scale things are going to happen, but we know one thing, that no matter what happens, no matter what's happening in the coming year, in the coming decade like this, that we will be fully absorbed in chanting and hearing and remembering Sri Krishna. Yes, that's all. So, mm -hmm. we're going to hear from Bhakti Vinod Thakur a little bit on this New Year's Eve evening. Uh -huh. And we're studying the Upadesha Amrita still. And now, because we're reading about Sangatyagat, I'm giving up on favorable association. So now, in the in-depth explanation purport of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, we've come to the next section of his explanation. Yeah, <clears throat> the last sentence of the last uh, paragraph that we, that we read is as follows. There is no other way but the association of Vaishnavas to eradicate attachment resulting from samskaras. No other way. So now he's telling that attachment to material things should be abandoned by everyone. That's the next section. One is to, one is to endeavor to give up all types of attachments to material objects. So here, here, there is a quite straightforward statement being made. That one is to do this. One is to endeavor to give up all types of attachments to material objects. So then he explains about how households, uh, they have they have a natural attachment to their home and its paraphernalia, to their wife and children, their beautiful clothes and ornaments, their body, their trees, their animals. Oh. Sorry, last week. Their trees, their animals, their birds, and the things used in their day-to-day -day living. Some people are so attached to bad habits, such as smoking, eating fish and meat, and drinking alcohol, that these habits end up being substantial hindrances to their spiritual practice. Have we not seen? We have seen. We have seen. Although it's the very strict rule of any Vaishnavas to follow the four regulative principles. Prabhupada introduced those four regulative principles in the very beginning of the movement. See, I was just hearing today while I was taking my lunch, uh, I like to put on uh, lecture tapes of Srila Prabhupada when I take prasadam by myself in my room. Uh, it's always very enriching for me. And I have these uh, files of Srila Prabhupada's lectures and uh, this particular section of the files is all of his lectures that are given on festival days. And uh, I've been going through this for the last few weeks of the lectures that he's giving on the appearance day and the disappearance day of his spiritual master, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Very amazing lectures. Very amazing. You know, and... Uh, he was telling the story today how he met his spiritual master earlier in his life and how he tried to execute the order that he should preach. Uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati 
ordered him you should preach in the English language, right? So Prabhupada was in a very brief way. He was outlining how he was making the endeavor to do that and eventually how he came by ship crossing the ocean to America. And he was on Boston Harbor when he arrived. There was a harbor in Boston before he came to New York. He was still on the ship for another day when he came to New York. And then he got off. But he got off in Boston also because there, there was a 24-hour wait in Boston. And he went uh, uh, on shore with the captain of the ship who was very respectful toward him as being a sannyasi and a sadhu. Uh, actually, Prabhupada kept a diary. Did you know that? When he was crossing the Atlantic. I love that diary. And then in New York, as for in the first year, he kept a diary, not all of the months, but a lot of the months he kept a diary of his daily activities. We have that, you know. And uh, so Srila Prabhupada, uh, he was thinking, here the culture is so opposite of what it is in India, right? And the people are educated in a different way. They're trained in different mode of behavior and so forth. And how will it be possible that uh, they will be able to adapt, to adopt this behavior, lifestyle, the Vaishnava, because it will require them to give up, right? It will require them eventually to give up all meat eating, eggs, fish, everything, any intoxication, any gambling, and any illicit sex. So, Srila Prabhupada had not yet entered into the environment that he was about to enter into during the 1965, you know, and uh, the hippie movement and all these things. But that was all happening. That was all happening at that time. The Vietnam War, protesting against that, and you know, the whole mood of the 60s. So, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada was thinking, and he was telling this in his lecture today, that, you know, how will they be able to accept this? You know, because if I mention to them that you have to give up these things, then they might say, you should go back to where you came from. <laughs> right? He was thinking like that. Then he mentioned how one of his god brothers, who was named Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj, had gone to England for preaching in the 1930s. Right? It was just prior to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada's departing from the planet. But he was a very great Vaishnava personality. And when he was in England, Srila Prabhupada was telling the story how there was one um, kind of a dignitary who used to be the, he used to be in India and he had some position in the British government in India and Srila Prabhupada said that when, when he himself went to school in his younger years, he went to one school that was called Scottish Churches College which was some Christian organization from Scotland had established this school, and it was English-based school. So Srila Prabhupada, for some time, was educated at that college. And he said that when he was young, he was probably in his teens, that this very person, who also later on, he met Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj in London, Right? He was older then. But in his younger years, he was named Lord Zetland. Lord Zetland. And he had a lot of appreciation, actually, for the Vaishnavas and the culture and so forth. But he was a British man. So Prabhupada said, I saw him. He, I sat right in front of him when he came to visit our school, you know, back when he was a student. So, 
So later on, that person was kind of, I guess he was in retirement mode by then. And he had met the devotees who were preaching on behalf of uh, Gaudi and Mutt in, in England. And so uh, Bhakti Saranga Goswami was um, having a conversation with him in London. And Lord Zetland asked him, because Lord Lord Zetland, he, he you know he understood the Hindu culture and Brahmins that there's Brahmins and there's divisions in society and so forth, and that the Brahmins are the highest and the purest, you know, and the intellectuals and all of that. He, he understood that because he had lived in India many years. So he said to Bhakti Saranga Goswami, he said, "Can you make me into a Brahmin?" Can I become a Brahmana? Is it possible for me to become a Brahmana? Yeah. And uh, then uh, Goswami Maharaj, he answered him, yes, it's, it is possible. Why not? It is possible. But you will have to adhere to certain rules and regulations in order for us to make you into a Brahmana. Oh, what are they? You'll have to give up all eating of meat, fish, eggs. You'll have to give up any intoxications, any alcohol, cigarettes, all of these things. You'll have to give up illicit sex. And you'll have to give up gambling. And then, if you can do this, we can make you a Brahman. Lord Zetlin answered, impossible. <laughs> so when Prabhupada was telling this in his lecture, the whole, all the audience, the devotees, they laughed. They laughed. Impossible. So then Srila Prabhupada was saying how, I also thought when I came, how will it be possible for them? I wasn't, he said, I wasn't very much, um, I think he used the word encouraged or something, because he knew that this was going to be such a major obstacle. But yet, he said, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has preached, very famous prediction verse that Lord Chaitanya spoke in the Chaitanya Bhagavat. Prithivite ache jata nagaradigram. This means, Prithivite means this earth planet. And ache jata nagaradigram means whatever nagar towns, uh, And grams, yeah. Nagar means like uh, a town, a village, and also uh, gram. Gram means village, and nagar means more like a city, towns, towns and villages. That's how Prabhupada translated. So what Mahaprabhu told and predicted, whatever. Uh, towns and villages that there are on the whole earth planet. He said, Prithivite, that means on this earth. He says, Sarvatra, in all of them, Sarvatra prachar hoibe mor nam. In all of them, my name, mor nam, it will be preached everywhere. So Srila Prabhupada was saying that Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord. He is not uh, suggesting something here out of fancy, you know, like poetically, oh, everywhere on the earth. No, it is literal. It is literal meaning. Everywhere on this earth planet, my name will be heard. And so Srila Prabhupada was saying that 
With faith in the order of my Guru Maharaj, I continued. But I was thinking that in the course of my interacting with these people, as soon as I start to mention to them the regulated principles, then they will go away. Yeah. And then Srila Prabhupada said, because he was in front of, it's, he, he gave this lecture in America, and he was in front of a large audience of all of his disciples. And they all cheered when Prabhupada said, but I continued, and all of you came, and you accepted. Very fortunate. So it has been proven that whatever is the previous samskaras, they can be changed by uh, a person coming into contact with a pure Vaishnava, hearing from them, and then following them. Then everything can be changed. So here, Bhaktivinoda Thakur is telling that, he said that one has to endeavor to give up all types of attachments to, their, to material objects, ultimately. So he's saying that some people are so attached to bad habits, such as smoking, eating fish and meat and drinking alcohol, that these habits end up being substantial hindrances to their spiritual practice. Some people, without any consideration, they disrespect Bhagavan's prasad by eating fish and meat and drinking wine. That was already going on in Bengal at the time when Bhaktivinoda Thakur was writing this. The habit of constantly smoking is such a hindrance to the study and the hearing of devotional scriptures and to the performance of kirtan that such scriptures cannot be relished for a very long time if somebody is attached. Constantly smoking is a hindrance. People who are powerless against such habits, they cannot remain for long within temples. Nor can they derive bliss from being in the association of sadhus for an extended period. So here's the thing. I remember when I became a devotee and these regulations were there and I embraced them in the association of the devotees and under the direction of Srila Prabhupada, although I hadn't physically met him yet. But my whole life changed completely. I became so happy and so illuminated. So it was very clear that I was living amongst maybe 30 devotees in that first temple in Detroit. And uh, I, I, I saw these devotees as being like demigods, like such pure beings. I hadn't met like that in my life. Uh, so in this way, the Hare Krishna movement, Srila Prabhupada introduced, and the world had accepted, right? And uh, so he says, as long as, as long as one uh, does not completely give up attachment to material objects, then one cannot experience the joy of bhajan. So if we want to, to experience the bliss and the joy of bhajan, right, which is, it's our objective. We've come to this lifestyle to become happy in, in, in our natural position, right? But if one does not completely give up attachment to material objects, then one cannot experience the joy of bhajan. Yeah. See, that's the thing. That over Gradually, over time, gradually, over time, gradually, over time, we will gradually experience more of this happiness and bliss, and it will encourage us. Because it's automatic, actually. By executing bhakti, automatically, detachment is the side effect of bhakti. There's a verse that actually says that in the Bhagavatam. Uh, Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janiyati Ashu Vairagyam Jnanam Cha Yad Ahoitukam. He says, by performing bhakti yoga, to Vasudev Krishna. Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita. Very intensive 
practice of bhakti yoga. Then janiyati, janiyati ashu vairagya. Very soon, very quickly, automatically, vairagya, detachment and renunciation, arise. Jnanam chayat ahoytukam. And also, jnana, knowledge. Ahoytuki means causelessly. This automatically happens. So, all these attachments, they are easily destroyed by association with sadhus. Still, one should endeavor to destroy these petty attachments through the practice of bhakti. One should endeavor. There should be an intention there. And these attachments can be vanquished by observing vratas that have relevance to Bhagavan. Now the next section is attachment is eradicated by following ekadasi and other vratas. Mm. By faithfully and properly observing ekadasi, janmastami, gor purnima, ram nomi, nishringa chaturidasi, and other such vratas, these attachments are easily vanquished. So that's part of the Vaishnava lifestyle. We go through the whole year with many holy days. You know, in the Western Christian civilization, they have a couple of holidays, they call. But we have continual. Huh? Our, in our culture, we have continual holy days and remembrances of the appearance days of the Supreme Lord in his various incarnations, the appearance and the disappearance days of, um, of the pure Vaishnavas and so forth. So, yes, all of these attachments can be vanquished by observing bratas that have relevance to Bhagavan. So, these attachments will be very easily vanquished by faithfully and properly observing Ekadasi, Janmastami, Kaur Purnima, Ram Nomi, Nishrinka Chaturdasi, and other such vrats. One of the purposes of observing vratas and regulations is to remove attachments. This is one of the purposes. On the day of a vrat, one should single-pointedly perform bhajan of Bhagavan and relinquish all types of enjoyment. This is the one and only rule on Vrata days. Relinquish attachments, and material enjoyment, uh, and single-pointedly perform bhajan. This is the one and only rule. Now, the objects of enjoyment are of two types. Those that sustain life and those that gratify the senses. So here we come to the principle that Srila Prabhupada used to mention, that one should eat uh, as much as is required to keep the body and the soul together. That means, it's so that you don't die. What? It's not a lot. <laughs> no, but the point is that that's the purpose. Yeah. Now, he'll go into more explanation of this. There's two types of enjoyment, those that sustain life and those that gratify the senses. The food and drink, they are life-sustaining. Is it not? Mm -hmm. You die if you stop drinking and eating. Whereas alcohol, meat, betel, tobacco, cigarettes, and so on, they are all for gratifying the senses. On the days of vratas, it is necessary to completely give up all objects of sense gratification. Otherwise, one will not have properly followed the vrata. One should also try as far as possible to decrease the items needed to sustain one's life. <clears throat> According to the needs of one's bodily condition, one must try as far as possible to reduce even the acceptance of life-sustaining foods, foodstuffs. So that's gradual. This is gradual. Mm -hmm. And it says, according to the needs of one's bodily condition. Not everyone's needs are the same. 
So, to meet one's minimal requirement, a provision exists to accept anu kalpa. That means simple, non-grain foodstuff. That's called anu kalpa. So, on a codice, if someone cannot do full fasting, they can take something for the s s sustaining, but minimal. The provision exists to accept anukalpa. However, however, there is no such rule for accepting objects of sense gratification. The only rule is that they are to be completely rejected. So what's being told here? To only accept what is needed for one's maintenance. Right. Because there's two types of enjoyment. And so anukalpa, that's acceptable, right? Because for life sustaining. But all the other, uh, there, there, there is no rule, uh, such rule, for accepting objects of sense gratification, as were mentioned here. The only rule is that they are to be completely rejected. Now, one of the purposes of, of observing vratas is to gradually diminish the propensity for enjoyment. Writing messages or notes? Huh? Taking notes. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> So one of the purposes of observing vratas is to gradually diminish the propensity for enjoyment. Yeah. So there's enjoyment, and then there's the propensity for enjoyment. If one thinks, today I will somehow or other endure the austerity of being without a particular item, but I will enjoy it profusely tomorrow. So... He's telling here a circumstance. Okay, today I'm going to not enjoy this, but tomorrow, after the brat, then I'm going to enjoy it profusely. <laughs> so if, he said, if one thinks in this way, then the vrata will not be successful in its objective. The reason is that vratas have been prescribed so that one may give up such items by gradual practice. Vratas are usually observed for three days. In this way, by giving up the association of the objects of sense enjoyment for three days, then for the month-long Chandrayana Vrat, and then by uh, observing the four months of Chaturmasya Vrat, and other vrats in the same way, such objects will gradually be given up forever. That's the objective there. The renunciation of those who, at the time of observing a vrat, cannot remember the statement of the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna in the ninth chapter, 31st verse, where, where Krishna says, Kshipram Bhavati Dharmatma. There, Krishna is saying, Dharmatma means to become righteous. Dharmatma. So kshipram means quickly. Quickly. Kshipram, kshipram bhavati dharmatma. Krishna is telling Arjuna that he very quickly he becomes righteous. Now, the renunciation of those who at the time of observing a vrata cannot remember the statement of the Bhagavad Gita very quickly, he becomes righteous. So their renunciation is fleeting, like the results of an elephant's bath. You know, there's an example of an elephant bathing, mm -hmm. putting dust after bathing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what he's saying here now about how by observing vratas, gradually we can give up these objects of material enjoyment. Is not saying that the other types of objects that are life-sustaining have to be given up. But even it can be reduced in course of time. I mean, what is the highest example of this? 
are six Goswamis. Are six Goswamis who lived in Braj. And they practically forgot to eat, to sleep. Very good. Yeah. But if someone tries to imitate that, they will absolutely fail. No one can imitate. Some people do try to do that just through the ability, because some persons have much more ability to do austerities than others do, you know? Depends on their physical constitution and so forth, you see? But then some persons have tried to imitate chanting so many rounds, doing so many dandavat pranams, like the six Goswamis used to do. However, have they attained Krishna Prem, those persons who are trying to imitate? No. Do they have the separate, extreme separation mood that is in the hearts of the six Goswamis continually, non-stop, 24 hours a day? No. So no one should try to imitate. But like the next quality in Upadesha Amrita after this fifth <clears throat> item, which is Sangatyagat, then the next item that we'll be reading about is called Sato Vritte. And Sato Vritte actually, it means that we should follow the example and we should follow in the footsteps of the previous great Acharyas. Following their example and footsteps is not imitating. There's a difference. One is called, um, forgetting the Sanskrit term right now. Oh yeah, Anukarana and Anusarana. Anukarana means imitating. What he's doing, I'm imitating. But Anusarana means to follow, uh, to follow their example as best one can according to one's level, you see. So, <clears throat> just one more little section then we'll complete tonight's class. Uh, it says, the Bhakti Thakur is saying that association to be abandoned. The inappropriate association of women and non-devotees is in all ways prohibited for those who desire to attain pure bhakti. Inappropriate is the word used here. Inappropriate association of women and non-devotees. That's been the topic all along here. Non-devotees, non-Krishna bhaktas, and also association of women. It means the opposite sex. So this is in all ways prohibited for those who desire to attain pure bhakti. For this, for this, satsanga is extremely necessary. In addition to this, it is also necessary to follow Vaishnava vratas in order to remove attachment to material objects. To neglect this is improper. These vratas will not bear fruit if they are followed without faith. Rather, pride and duplicity will increase. Instead of the vratas bringing the desired result, if one is not following the vratas with great faith, then what will happen is pride and duplicity will increase. Uh, and Hari Bhakti will become difficult to attain despite hearing Shravanam and chanting Kirtanam for many lifetimes. Whoa. So this is a very important point. A very important point. This is why Srila Prabhupada gave these four regulated principles. Because within them, one becomes protected from Kali Yuga. Maharaj Kali. Yes. All those tendencies are there in those breaking of the four regulated principles. And when we see devotees, neophytes, who succumb to the temptation of sense gratification, maya with the opposite sex and all of that, and associating with so many people who are not devotees. When we see that, 
what do we observe becomes the result of that? Their bhakti is lost. Seen it innumerable, innumerable times. Every time. Yeah. Now, uh, that's why in the Vaishnava culture, there is appropriate ways, not inappropriate, but appropriate ways to have that association. But if someone then just throws caution to the wind, and they just say, oh, I'm just going to go out there and enjoy my senses. Well, that's a very foolish and unfortunate uh, and very dangerous, very dangerous. Because it can lead to other fall downs and so forth, you see. Yeah, so, yeah. Vaishnava vratas can remove the attachment for material objects. So like, you know, we also have our vratas, the chanting a certain number of java, of rounds, like that, following various regulated times during the day. These are also the types of vratas. But the occasional vratas that come by holy days and appearance days, just like day after tomorrow, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. That is a very, very powerful, very powerful spiritual day. Extremely powerful. Because he's the one, you know, he's the one who was sent from Goloka Vrindavan to establish this movement, uh, appearing as the son of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And he's He's the Jagat Guru, you know? And so his teachings and his words and his life and everything, when we hear about that, it is so purifying. And we develop relationship with him. His lotus feet in our heart. This is what we want, especially on these appearance days and disappearance days of the Acharyas. Yes. So... Just go to eight, there's another four minutes. So, <clears throat> what are Sangha? Here he's asking the question what are Sangha and what are Sangha Tyag? What, what are Sangha and what are Sangha Tyag? Giving up Sangha. Now, numerous types of doubts arise in many people regarding Sangha and Sangha Tyaga, and for good reason. If association were to be defined by mere proximity to worldly persons or objects, right? If that was the meaning of association, that you're in proximity <laughs> to worldly persons or objects, if that were to be the definition, then there would be no means of avoiding such association. As long as one has a material body how can the association of the objects and the items required to sustain one's life be renounced? Hmm. How does a householder Vaishnava leave his family members? Can he just do that? Whether one stays at home or in the forest, <clears throat> it is necessary to visit worldly persons in order to maintain one's body. Therefore, in establishing the limits of Sangha and Sangha Tyag, Srila Rupa Goswami has written in Sri Upadesha Amrita, verse 4, the, the six types of association. Dadati Pratigrinati, Guhyam Akyati Pritchati, Bhunkte Bojayate Chaiva, Shadvidam Priti Lakshanam. Offering pure devotees items in accordance with their requirements. That's the first principle, dadati. Dadati means, and he's saying that these uh, exchanges are meant to be with pure devotees, right? Mm -hmm. So offering pure devotees items in accordance with their requirements, then accepting prasadi, that means remnant from them items given by pure devotees. 
Second pair, revealing to devotees one's confidential realizations concerning concerning bhajan and also inquiring from them about their confidential realizations. Then, eating with great love the prasad remnants given by devotees and lovingly feeding them prasad. These are the six symptoms of loving association with devotees. Now, Bhaktivinoda Thakur exclaims, O Sadakas! Exclamation mark. O Sadaks! For sustaining one's bodily journey, it is necessary to be near both devotees and non devotees. Right? Because your bodily journey in this world. You're going to be near sometimes to devotees and you sometimes you'll be near to non-devotees. Both householders and renunciants are equal in this regard. But there is one recourse. There may be closeness without association. In other words, proximity, but not association. So he's saying if reciprocal giving and taking and reciprocal conversing, reciprocal eating, and other mutual exchanges are done with a binding affection, preeti, then it is considered to be sangha. So you understand this point now? Mm -hmm. What is considered to be sangha and what is not considered to be sangha? If you're in the proximity of these people, it's considered uh, association if you're uh, dealing with them on a level where there's some kind of uh, exchange of affection or attachment. Yes, preeti, right? So then it's considered to be sangha. So he says, the food that is given to the hungry, the help that is provided to the poor, and the donation of a religiously minded donor are all given and received as a duty. Understand? As a duty. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give some charity to the hungry and food to the hungry. And <laughs> this is done as a duty. There is no mutual sangha between the beggar and the donor because of a lack of affection. But when these actions are imbued with affection, then they are called sangha. Hmm? Then it's called sangha. Hence, to have loving exchanges with non-devotees is ku-sangha, bad association. And to have them with pure Vaishnavas is satsangha. That's the difference. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Very clear. Yeah. Assume, assume that a mundane person has come to you. And now, considering it your duty, you interact with him as necessary. Hmm? You do not speak confidentially with him about one's spiritual realizations because generally affection develops by such confidential talks. And if affection develops, then the fault of taking undesirable association arises. That's the problem, see? If a friend or a family member comes to you, you can speak what is necessary, but it is better to not affectionately reveal topics that are dear to one's heart. If that same person is a Vaishnava, then the conversation ought to be filled with affection. See? So by following these directives, <clears throat> there will not be any possibility of opposition from friends. There is no sangha in customary, customary practical conversations. No sangha. Customary, practical conversations. A sadhak ought, ought to interact with ordinary persons with detachment, just as one interacts in the market with buyers or sellers. Hmm? However, when interactions are with pure devotees, they are to be loving. 
So when feeding hungry and suffering persons or professional educators, then treat them as guests. But it is not necessary to have a special heartfelt affection for them. Make efforts to help them, but without a binding affection. Feed only sadhus and pure Vaishnavas. Feed only sadhus and pure Vaishnavas such, in such an affectionate way and lovingly accept the prasad they give. And if one interacts with one's spouse, children, servants, and visitors in the above-mentioned way, it will not be considered a satsanga, and satsanga can still be taken. If one does not consider all these points and give up bad association, there is no hope of attaining Krishna Bhakti. Okay. Now, this is the final paragraph. I'm going a little over because I, I want to finish this section. This is the end of the uh, fifth item. And then tomorrow we'll do the final item uh, of uh, uh, Janasangas, no, uh, Sangatyaga Satovritte, Satovritte, tomorrow. Here's the last paragraph. It is proper for renounced Vaishnavas to accept whatever alms they have collected through madukari, that means begging small amounts of food, from the homes of devotee householders. I mean, this is the age-old custom in the whole Vedic civilization, is that sannyasis will beg in this way, madukari. It, you know, this refers to the bumblebee who goes from one flower to another, just taking little, 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 right? So they should always remember these sannyasis. They should always remember the difference between material bhiksha, bhiksha, bhiksha means begging, and madukari bhiksha. They, there's a big difference. Household Vaishnavas are to accept prasad and grains only in the homes of devotee householders who possess good character. One is to be careful not to honor prasad at the house of non-devotees and persons of bad character. There is no need for further instruction on this matter. A living entity who possesses spiritual merit, that means Sukriti, he develops faith in bhakti by a mere few words. Okay? No need to have extensive, extensive but just by a mere few words, uh, that living entity who has this Sukriti, oh, he develops bhakti by just hearing a few words. By the mercy of Krishna, some intelligence has already arisen in him. Through this intelligence, he can easily understand the essence of the Acharya's instructions. This is so important what he's saying. This is at the very end of this whole section. I'm gonna go into it just a little. Now I'm just finishing reading this. Through, his in, through this intelligence, he can easily understand the essence of the Acharya's instructions. Therefore, such people require concise directives. But persons without spiritual merit, they lack faith. There is no point in giving them additional instructions. Therefore, Srila Rupa Goswami has given only a few words of instruction for sadhaks. End of this section. Yeah. Sadhu, sadhu vritti, sato vritti, adopting the virtual con virtuous conduct of pure devotees. So, we can see how Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has explained in so many of these pages that we've read that Sangatyag is absolutely essential for advancing in bhakti. Association with material objects and 
samskaras with the items that are material enjoyment in, in regard to material enjoyment. Those have to be given up by serious Vaishnavas. And, but it should be done more in a gradual way. Uh, in a gradual way, one will proceed forward and always carefully trying to uh, adhere to the instructions given by the pure Vaishnavas to live one's life according to that, then one is always safe. But we should do our renunciation uh, in a practical way. It's like he's given so many instructions about following various bratas and so forth. This is all very doable. This is all very helpful, right? But at the same time, we have to understand that uh, we should be careful not to become too much extreme. Everything should be moderate, moderate. Krishna also tells this in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Eating, sleeping, recreation, and so forth. Those issues should be done moderately. But we should practice this, and gradually transcendental knowledge will come into our hearts. Actual tattva gyan, real tattva gyan, it will come into the heart. And then everything becomes clear, more and more and more. So our Dandavat Pranams at the Lotus Feet of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur for giving these beautiful purports and to the Lotus Feet of Srila Rupa Goswami for giving us the Sri Upadesha Amrita and all of our Acharyas for giving their commentary. And, uh, and we pray for the mercy and the association of pure Vaishnavas, not just in this life, but in all lives. That's why Tandera Charana Sevi Bhakta Sane Das. We, we sing that, Pariharai Nama Krishna, after the Tulsi Parikrama. And there, Dharatam Das is saying, <clears throat> Tandera Charana Sevi Bhakta Sane Das. That means, the association, living in the association of such pure Vaishnavas as who are the servants of the six Goswamis. Charana Sevi, Tandera Charana Sevi means those Vaishnavas who are, who are serving the lotus feet of the six Goswamis in their lives. Bhaktasanevas living in their association, spending our life, going through our life in their association, janame janame hoy e abhinas. This is my desire, birth after birth. You see? So anyone who can feel like that, they are fortunate souls. We want to become fortunate, more and more and more fortunate. So, luckily, Krishna has arranged this for us in our life. Now, we have to continue charting our course uh, according to the directions of the pure Vaishnavas, and we will be successful. There's no doubt about it. Gaur Premanande. Jai Shri Shri Guru Gaurang Gandhar Vika Giridhari Radha Vinod Vihari Radha Govinda Jiyo Ki Jai Vrindai Tosi Devai Priyai Krishna Dasi Chakrishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satya Vachai Namo Namo Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare.
All glories to the assembled devotees. Jai. Thank you for coming to our Charu Chandrika and to our to our Damodar Prabhu and who else is there on our Facebook Live. My Dandavats and Happy New Year to all the devotees. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.